Hi, everyone. We're going to get started here as folks join in. Um, please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, thanks, everyone who's joining us today. Uh, I'm Alice Quinlan, impact producer for the documentary film No Time to Fail from filmmakers Sarah Archambault and Marco Guernsey. No Time to Fail follows local election administrators as they work around the clock to secure the vote for their community amidst an onslaught of attacks from a sitting president and the deadly threat of a global pandemic. Rhode Island's election teams take center stage in this unprecedented voting adventure. We are really honored to have three amazing individuals with us today for this webinar focused on mental health and wellness for election officials. Our moderator for this conversation is Rachel Lastinger, Senior Program Associate in the Democracy Program at the Carter Center. Rachel has worked on elections in multiple counties at the center for the last five years and has helped to spearhead their work to support the mental health of election officials. Also joining us are Tina Barton and Kathy Placencia. Tina Barton is a senior election expert with the Elections Group. She joined the Elections Group with over 32 years of government experience serving at the federal, county, and local levels. The last 17 years of her career have been focused on election administration. Before joining the Elections Group, Tina was the senior program advisor to the executive director at the US Election Assistance Commission. She served as the city clerk of Rochester Hills, Michigan before joining the EAC. She holds a Master of Arts in Management and Leadership from Liberty University and a Bachelor of Business Administration. Kathy Placencia is the Director of Elections for Rhode Island Secretary of State Greg M. Amore. Before joining the Department of State, Kathy served as the Administrator of Elections for the City of Providence for 17 years. Kathy is active in the community and serves on several boards, including the Board of Omni Development Corporation, Kathy previously served on the advisory board for RISE, Realizing Inspiration and Sustaining Excellence Women's Leadership Conference, and as a board member of the Providence YMCA. Kathy received her Bachelor of Science with a concentration in human services from Springfield College. I'm really excited for this conversation. Take it away, Rachel. Great, thank you so much for that um, introduction, Alice. Um, and we just wanna thank the team at the No Time to Fail documentary for making this webinar possible. Um, this webinar is a little bit of a follow-up to some events that we did on May 18th. So on May 18th, which was Mental Health Action Day, we had the privilege of working with the No Time to Fail team to provide election officials across the nation access to the film um, and a copy of the Wellness Resource Guide created for election officials by the Carter Center, which um, later I can share that links to that in the chat for everyone. Um, and so we had over 500 election officials sign up to watch the film on May 18th, which is awesome. Um, and we wanted to follow up on that viewing with a special conversation on the impact the 2020 elections had on those working to make them happen and how these incredible humans who make elections a reality in our country are working to take care of themselves in the aftermath of a traumatic election cycle. As we saw in the video, or you will see in the video um, once you watch it, um, election officials work tirelessly to provide a safe and secure election in their county and make sure every eligible voter had the ability to cast their ballot, often working way beyond 40 hours a week. Plus, they were trying to navigate elections during a pandemic with little to no support. In addition to working under extreme pressure and exhausting circumstances, Many election officials found themselves enduring threats, harassment, and intimidation. In the years following the 2020 elections, this behavior has persisted as our nation deals with increasing amounts of mis- and disinformation about our elections. We wanted to create the space today to allow for some of these stories to be told so that any election officials listening can know that they are not alone and can also know more about some resources that could be a benefit to them. And so that those of us that aren't election officials, you know, can also hear these stories and really know what it's like. Um, so in response to all the above, we are seeing many election officials, some who had made this their lifelong career, leave their job because they just can't take it anymore and often don't feel safe. Um, Tina and Kathy, um, thank you guys so much for joining us today and it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, would you be willing to share with us how the 2020 elections and the years following have impacted not only your careers, but your quality of life? Maybe we can start with uh, Tina. 
Well, thank you, Rachel and Alice and, and just both of your teams for sharing um, your resources and shedding light on this topic uh, and the, the critical need that we have for these conversations. Yeah, 2020 certainly was um, a career life-changing year, if you will. Um, when I look back at how it's impacted not only my career, but also uh, my family, uh, the 2020 cycle was obviously in the middle of a pandemic. We were um, grappling with changes to laws, new implementation of laws, new procedures because of the pandemic, and then also trying to uh, do things like find new precinct locations because of the pandemic, um, figure out how we were going to handle the uh, increased absentee ballots that we were going to see. I also oversaw cemeteries. So we were handling um, burials during the pandemic that were just heart-wrenching with family members unable to attend because they couldn't travel. And, and so all of these things were, were going on during the 2020 cycle. We were working as many hours as we physically could, trying to do things in a safe manner. I have an autoimmune, so that kind of um, escalated the, the risk for me uh, to be out there, um, you know, coming to terms with all of that. And then also just um, having the election itself take place for there to be so much controversy and uh, so many questions uh, around uh, the outcome and, and the processes. And then just a week after the election cycle, receiving a, a death threat to me personally and um, having that individual also state that not only, you know, would they be coming after me, that they were going to be coming after my family that there was no um, police force that was going to be big enough to uh, be able to keep me safe all the time. And when I would least expect it um, is when they would come for me. And just dealing with the emotions from that, the mental impact of that, um, and also uh, the safety measures that we had to put in place at work for my staff, for my team to make sure everyone was safe there. Um, and then also at home, uh, you know, installing a new security system. I'm married to a law enforcement officer going over, you know, processes that we would do at home, having safe words that if we say that word, then that means that we're in trouble or something's gone wrong. And just having conversations that you never expected to have with your family, uh, enduring emotions that I had not experienced before. Uh, the physical exhaustion that I don't know that I had ever experienced that level before having ran elections for 16 years prior, it was still nothing like what we experienced in 2020. And so it was everything that you could possibly experience and, and have to do at work. And it was almost like it was like amplified to twice of what, what the normal would be. And so it's, um, yeah, it's 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 life changing that um, I am no longer in serving as a city clerk, but what it has done for my career is made me very focused on two things, and that is the safety and security of election officials, of voters, of precincts and location. And I obviously uh, being here today, I am extremely concerned about the mental health of election officials and what they're enduring right now. Thank you, Tina, uh, Kathy. Um, well, I want to thank you, Rachel and Alice, um, for putting this together and for having us sit, um, you know, sit on this panel. But, um, you know, like Tina, we have, uh, you know, there's so much more to elections. It's now, you know, elections are on the map and it's, it's you know, elections are full time where it, there's so much more. There's, uh, you know, so many layers that um, now we're so we're under the microscope and there we have all this pressure of having to be perfect all the time um, because of the perception of the election deniers or being judged or second guess where one small thing can lead to um, to doubt in elections. Um, you know, and the way that this dealing with the 2020 elections um, on top of the pandemic, it's like your your anxiety is just heightened, um, you know. We were very fortunate when we weren't threatened um, here in Rhode Island, um, you know, but it, it, it's more of trying to put together an election, a job that you have done for so many years um, under this pressure and, and with the trying to figure out the safety of your employees, your families. Um, 
you know, being worried about that, uh, making sure that we're not, we're doing everything that we can so that we don't get sick, so that we're protected, not knowing what was happening with, with uh, you know, with COVID and, and how it's going to affect each person individually. So you're constantly having that conversation where um, you're telling your, your team, like whatever you do outside of this office is going to affect each one of us individually um, and not just each one of us individually, but our families. Um, so it's not just looking out for your own health. It's, it's thinking about the health of everyone else, um, everyone else's families on your team. Um, you know, dealing with the security and the safety of, of election officials on election day, hoping that your election officials um, are not getting sick and are able to, to work on election day, finding new precincts, um, you know, so many places as, as you, you know, you'll see in the movie that were, um, or in the documentary that just didn't want to have use have us use them as a polling location because they were afraid and you know how can you tell someone you know how can you deny someone of their right to vote walking into a building because they have their own policies um and 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 also ensuring polling locations that we're doing everything that we can uh to, to make sure that the voters and the facilities and 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 uh, are safe um, so I, although I'm not running elections on the municipal side, it's still a scary situation and coming into the 2024 elections, I feel that it's, it's, you know, it's just one of those, um, after dealing with 2020, where you're just, again, your anxiety is heightened, you're just waiting for, for the for the worse or what can happen um, and, and worrying about the safety, the security uh, of elections. Um, so that's the that's been the constant conversation um, where how can we continue to make um, elections secure? Great. Thank you both so much. Yeah, I would say if you don't mind just you know kind of inputting there that that constantness that you were talking about, that is it's really like they're drinking from this hose where they you know can't find the shutoff valve and but they also feel like they're drowning because they they can't stop the flow and it it's kind of been that way since 2020 and i'm hearing this as i travel the country from election officials i keep hearing the phrase you know i'm so exhausted i'm so tired and they they are so worried there there is this level of anxiety of i know what happened in 2020 and this it's been 3 years of of anxiety building up like you said of what is going to happen now we know what has happened and and the psychological impact of the unknown and the anticipated um you know issues that that could occur in this like you said this pressure to be perfect you know and and when you're dealing with humanity and dealing with so many election workers and and people that you've trained to to do jobs um it's it's an impossible task to expect absolute perfection, but that is the level that election officials hold themselves to. They hold themselves to a standard of perfection and championing, we like to say at the elections group that we champion the process and not the outcome. And they're out there just championing the process right now. So they're not only trying to respond to all the new laws that have come into play, all the new processes that have come into play, but they're also trying to prepare they're also trying to mentally and psychologically prepare and still all that time carrying baggage, if you will, from the 2020 cycle that, that is still on them and, and the emotions and, and things like that that they were dealing with that's left from 2020. I love that phrase so much, Tina, championing the process, not the outcome. I've yet to meet an election official in this country who uh, same like isn't championing uh, the process. Um, so before we ask our next question, um, we're going to share a short clip um, from the film that kind of exemplifies um, some of what you guys have been discussing. This is my real mom speaking. Virtual mom. Virtual the mom. real mom gets home later. <laughs> But the real mom said, told virtual mom to please let Sophia know what she needs to do for tonight. Okay. So we're 
Give Jacob the phone. All right, so then when you're done reading, after your, your time is up, then I want you to call me and tell me all about the stuff that you read. And then take a shower. And then you're going to go take a shower. Okay? Bye. 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 Renee? Yeah. Hi, it's Kathy. Do you know how many supervisors we have? No, we have 254 soups. That's not including what's at the Dunkin' Donut Center. Correct. Dios mio. What the fuck? Where is the time? Uh, no, Candy, I swear this lunch and cycle is, it's time is against us. I mean, it's never been like this before. No. I mean, it was just that time is against us. The locations don't want us. We're going to get this done, kiddo. You wait and see. I know. In three weeks, Kathy, nobody will know us. We'll be back to being those anonymous people. That's right. Yeah. But being in the background is better. Mm-hmm. It really, really is. Yeah. Thank you. All right, bye. Bye. Let me see how many messages I have. You have 75 new voice messages and one saved voice message. I feel like that um, is such an impactful clip from that film. Um, well, that really sticks with you. But Kathy, can you tell us a little bit more about what that clip and what was going on for you at that time? Um, you're almost on autopilot as a parent um, where you have your one function. Sorry. No um, need to apologize for emotions on this <laughs> webinar. That's why we're here. The PTSD, geez, um, where you're almost, um, you know, there is no time to feel anything as a parent because you have one function to do. You have to make sure that you're getting it done right. Um, so you kind of have to block everything else out and you become so robotic um, where it's like, okay, you have to read, you have to take a shower, you have to get ready for, you know, you have to do all of your nighttime routine so that we can get ready to do this all over again tomorrow where I'm not here. I am just, I'm there in the morning to take you to school, and then that's it. Um, so, yeah. You know, the one thing uh, about that clip is that really kind of hit me is also, I'm a mom, but um, when she hangs up, the sigh the side that she gives when she hangs up the phone, you, you heard it, you heard it in, you could hear it in her spirit of how she was feeling at that, that moment, right? You could just hear her release that in that sigh. And what I do love about that clip and even this moment, Kathy, is that it humanizes you. You are a person, right? We are not robots, we are individuals. We are not the enemy. You are someone's mom. You are you are your own individual outside of that office. You are a person. You go to the same grocery store that your neighbors go to, right? You go to the same school events that your neighbors take their kids to and you take your daughter to and all of that. And I feel like what has happened over the last few years is this dehumanization of election officials that we're no longer seen as people that we are seen as the enemy or name calling, if you will, uh, of whatever it is, but you're standing between them and what they want or the result and what they want. And it, they are no longer seeing you as that person anymore. And you are a person, your feelings are valid. What you're feeling even in this moment, what you felt in that sigh, is is so real and so raw for you even today that that's why it's so important that we continue these conversations and I, I think about groups like uh, issue one that are doing you know this faces of democracy where we are lifting election officials up and saying hey they are people they are real people with real feelings they are real individuals 
And, and we need to be careful in the way that we're talking and we're treating them because they're actual people, right? So there's this, to get rid of this dehumanization that's taking part in seeing people for who they are. Yeah, thank you so much for verbalizing that, Tina. I love how the film at multiple times like showed you truly going out of your way, Kathy, to like make these elections happen in your county and make sure that every voter in your county had the ability to vote. And even on that clip at the end, we see that you have 75 voicemails. Like it just shows the extreme pressure you were under. And yet we also got to see you just being a mom and just being a human. Um, and I think it's so beautiful how the film captured that. And it's such a relatable reality for so many election officials out there. Like at the end of the day, you are a mom and you're a citizen and a human being. And we have to remember that. Um, can you guys kind of now take the time to share with us a little bit more about the support or probably often lack of support that you felt like you received in the time following the elections? And how have you been able to find any help on coping with the trauma of 2020? I think, you know, um, I, I feel for us as election um, or in the elections field, we didn't receive any support because we're not, we weren't considered frontline workers. Um, you know, the, the, the people that were receiving that support were nurses and doctors and anyone else in, in the field that was not in elections. Um, and, you know, and that's where we felt the lack of support where it was, you're just here, you're here to do your job and um, make sure that everything is done properly. Um, but we're not worried about your safety. We're not worried about the security of elections. Um, you're just going to continue on the function and we're going to provide you with your mask and your um with your mask and, and hand sanitizer. And that's pretty much it. I think we, I don't even think that we were able to get tested. Um, we, there was there was no testing. We weren't able to get um, you know COVID tests. Not even in our offices. Um, we weren't. We had to wait for an appointment like everyone else. Um, you know to to get to get tested for COVID. Um, and and so you know there was one at one point where we had to shut down our offices and and work remote and um, and because we had a COVID scare and you know, um, and we weren't even to get, we weren't even able to get that person tested at that time. Um, so those were the, that was the lack of support um, that we were, that I felt we were receiving or not receiving. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I think that so many of us found ourselves feeling really isolated and very kind of siloed off from everyone else, because like she said, uh, you know, the majority of the people in city hall were able to work from home uh, was not an option for us. Uh, we had to be there. We had to be issuing uh, ballots and and preparing precincts and all of the training workers and all and all of those things. And so we were putting our health at risk, knowing also that we were coming home after having been in those environments and now possibly exposing our family members um, to whatever it was or whoever we were exposed to. And so, I mean, we were putting ourselves, uh, whether we were considered a frontline worker or not, we were frontline. And I do um, commend, you know, the Rochester Hills mayor and city council, they did um, uh, vote to give our staff uh, frontline worker pay after you know, I brought it to their attention that I have a ton of respect for the police and the law enforcement, my husband and the, the firemen, you know, my husband is in public service and public safety, um, but the, also to recognize that my people were also out there um, being exposed and seeing people every day. I think um, two of a phone call that I received from a fellow clerk and just kind of talking about the resources that we, we didn't receive, and she called me and she said, Tina, she said, we don't have the budget in for our city for us to go out and get products to protect our election workers or our voters out in the precincts. She said, my husband has a Home Depot credit card and we went to Home Depot and we bought clear shower curtains and PVC pipe. And my husband and I are going to make our own protection for the precinct for the, the workers and the voters. That's the level that election officials were going to, that when their own communities did not have money or did not have resources to support them, they were taking it out of their own pockets 
to go places like Home Depot and buy PVC pipe and clear shower curtains to make sure that their precinct workers were safe and the voters were safe on election day. That's exactly where we were at in that moment of whatever we have to do, we will do because we will make sure that this election happens. Come hell high water or any kind of pandemic, we were going to make it happen and we did. Thank you guys both so much. Um, so yeah, there wasn't a lot of support during the 2020 elections, um, but we have seen a lot of response from the community following the elections with a lot of resources coming out. Um, and so I'd like to talk about some of those. Um, one gap in resources um, that was identified by the Carter Center was on how to take care of one's mental health and how to respond to trauma following the 2020 elections. Um, so the Carter Center created a resource called Taking Care of Yourself to Ser Serve Others, a well-being resource guide for election officials. In this resource, we discuss how to identify the effects of trauma on your life, um, and we provide a toolkit on how to cope with trauma, including tips on finding social support, how to find mental health support near you, using relaxation techniques, and implementing grounding strategies. Um, I did want to talk about some grounding strategies. Um, when experiencing flashbacks or distressing thoughts, um, grounding techniques can help you to reorient your mind toward the present moment. For instance, one common grounding technique is called the 54321 method. Um, you use your senses to notice five things you see, four things you hear, three things you can touch or feel, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. Um, other examples of grounding might include putting your hands in water and focusing on how the temperature and texture feels, or going for a walk and focusing only on your steps. All of these are just meant to bring you back into the present moment. Um, I know one that is really helpful for me is also I keep like an ice roller in my freezer and I just go and grab it and just something about like the ice or splashing cold water on your face can also help to bring you back to the present moment and be really helpful in those moments. Um, and there's a lot of great breathing exercises too, such as you can make like a, um, a square with your breasts and, you know, do one, four counts up, hold for four, four counts out, and then hold for four. And just like bring, bring, helping you to focus on your breathing can bring you back to the present moment. Um, but for you, Tina and Kathy, is there anything that you guys have found particularly helpful um, in your toolkit to cope with 2020 elections or something that you think would be helpful moving forward? Um, you know, I think what I have said before is um, it, during 2020 elections is thank goodness that my children were asleep by the time I got home um, because it was just one less thing I had to do. Um, but I find for, my, for me, um, what's helpful is before, uh, you know, before I walk in the house, I sit in the car for five minutes and I kind of just, you know, I, I kind of just sit and, and relax and just do absolutely nothing or listen to a song um, that's a little bit more relaxing for me or just play like, I don't know, just play something on my phone or um, just do mindless, do something that's mindless. Um, and that kind of helps me uh, set the tone for when I am walking home, uh, walking in the house to deal with, you know, with dinner and, and everything else that, you know, that I have going on um, uh, to, to deal with the with the real job of, you know, of, of driving who, where and, and um, who needs what. Um, so, you know, those are just some some of the or one of the techniques that I, I do use, um, you know, and I, I use a lot in 2020. Um, but and uh, but my daughter knows the other steps is, you know, the five steps of looking at something and, and focusing and sometimes she'll remind me um, that I need to do that. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I think one thing that was really helpful, especially after the 2020 election, is that there were a, there was a group of us that um, had been particularly focused on by um, some groups um, that were not believing the results of the election. And 
we started having um, kind of session get togethers where we would just meet kind of infrequently, but would all come together and just kind of talk about how we were feeling at that moment and what we were dealing with, the emotions that we were going through. It was therapeutic to talk about it with other people who understood what we were going, the other person, you know, what we were feeling and had been through the same thing and we're going through the same thing. So finding people that you can, um, that are trusted people that you can have those open conversations with about your raw emotions, whether that's family, whether it's a friend, whether it's a therapist. Um, I, I think that, you know, uh, getting beyond the stigma of talking about mental health and realizing that there are people, it is um, something that is very real to, to talk with an individual about and finding that person that you can do that. I love the 10 minutes of, of quiet time of trying to start my day that way to just kind of clear my mind. Um, the breathing exercises, I find myself doing that if, you know, I feel like I'm anxious, um, the, the counting on my hands, I'll, I'll do that if I'm feeling anxious. Um, but finding what works for you in that moment, but making sure that you're not bottling that all inside, not keeping it all inside, that you're actually having those conversations and, and talking with someone who feels that, that you feel that you're being heard and that they can provide you uh, help and, and resources. Yeah, thank you both for sharing. Um, I also realized I got a little ahead of myself with our questions, so sorry, Tina. Um, but you know, similar to how the Carter Center respond, you know, saw this need, saw what was happening to our election officials in our com in our country, um, the elections group responded as well. And so, Tina, can you talk a little bit more about the committee for safe and secure elections um, and how you saw this crisis and decided to respond to it, and tell us a little bit more about what you guys offer. Yeah, so I think that we realize that for a lot of election officials that are finding themselves in this space, it has been because of either threats or harassment or um, uh, attack, you know, attacking language they use to attack them or um, just to um, make veiled threats or say general things, whatever it is that are psychologically impacting them, or even like I said, physical threats to their security. So the Committee for Safe and Secure Elections is really focused on, on the physical side of, of this. And so we're four groups that are cross-partisan that have come together. So you have our street, you have the Brennan Center for Justice, you have Protect Democracy and the elections group. And so we've all come together and we're, we're very focused on um, creating relationships and collaboration between election officials and law enforcement um, to help make sure that, that they are feeling physically safe, that their, their staff is feeling safe, that their precincts are safe. We're um, building those relationships, collaborating together, providing resources uh, for them so that they can walk through um, a five-step process that can help them get from meeting each other and exchanging information all the way through sharing and agreeing and planning and, and practicing through maybe tabletop exercises where they can bring scenarios and say, hey, this is a scenario that we're concerned about. Can we all sit down and walk through what this might look like? And so we are going out and, and uh, we have multiple states that have already contacted us, multiple counties that were out uh, doing these presentations on these five steps and walking through the, the TTXs, the tabletop exercises with the, the election officials and the law enforcement, as well as other stakeholders in the community um, to see how we can help keep these election officials safe. Because to me, that, that also helps the mental health side of it, because if you feel safe, if you feel secure, it's going to lessen your anxiety. It's going to, to lessen those feelings that you have of insecurity uh, when we have a plan. And we know that election officials are planners. That's what we do. We have plan A, plan B, plan C, plan, you know, whatever. We've always got a plan and we've got a backup plan. This is one area that we really haven't had to focus on in the past. And so our, the, with the Committee for Safe and Secure Elections, we're out there and we're wanting to help election officials put this plan, put this crisis plan together, this crisis communications plan and, and collaborate with our local law, uh, law enforcement. Great. Thank you, Tina. So if any uh, voters in your community are listening, um, what would you, say is the best way that they can show you support as you move into the 2024 election cycle? And also how might election officials be able to show each other support? 
I think be kind. Um, we're human. You know, there's so many things that we're, you know, again, it's this whole, um, you know, we have to be perfect because we're under the microscope. Um, but it's, it's, you, we don't know, no one knows the struggle that um, anyone else is going through on their personal lives and we're doing our jobs um, and we're expected to do it to perfection and we have all this pressure. Um, so just be kind to us where, you know, um, I don't think it's fair that um, people will use us as their punching bag and then, you know, that phone call is over and they forget, they go on about their day but now we have to sit here and carry those uh, those words and um, with us for the day, because that's what you know we're we're doing our jobs and um, we're just going by the law and and so again it's we're carrying all of that with us on a day to day basis where you hang up the phone and you don't give it a second thought. So be kind to people. Yeah, absolute kindness. What a novel concept, right? Um, to, to ask, don't attack, right? If you have questions, if there are things that you want to know, election officials love their jobs. They love what they do. They love sharing that with the community. Um, I always loved going out and, and doing um, public forums and answering questions that people had about elections. I loved that part of my job. That was one of my most favorite parts of it. So don't be afraid to ask them things, just don't attack them with things. And I think that that would be really helpful. Um, get engaged. If you really truly are curious um, or you don't believe in the process or you think that something is being done incorrectly, the best thing you can do is, is be an election inspector, or a worker, a judge, whatever it's called in your state, is to get engaged in the process and learn. And I give an example, if I had a gentleman who came in um, right prior to the November 2020 election, was absolutely convinced that our elections were, were rigged, that it was fraudulent, that there were all these areas where things could go wrong. And so I never, ever allowed someone to leave my office who had doubts about the process without handing them an application to work the election. And so I did that. I handed him an application. I strongly encouraged him to serve as an election inspector. He agreed to do so. He came to the training session and he sat through the two hours of training. He came up to me after the training session and he said, I want to apologize to you. And he said, I had no idea all the, the measures that you all have in place to make sure that this goes off like this and that there's so much integrity in the process and he said I honestly am going to decline to work as an election inspector because I don't think I can memorize all of this and do the job right and so I I feel like if people would actually get engaged and not just sit back and watch their television or get stuck in their silos on social media of hearing the same things over and over again but actually get engaged and sign up to be in a, a worker that I think that that positive action right there could um, really be a domino effect in our country of, of people actually learning what we do. Thank you, Tina. Um, you know, something you said, Kathy, reminded me, you know, one of the resources that the Carter Center offers in addition to the resource guide was also just a quick checklist. Um, on taking care of yourself that included, you know, 12 ways to protect your mental well-being. And it's something that we created for election officials to be able to post around their office, right? Um, but the first one on it, thing on it is be as kind to yourself as you would be to a friend. And I, I think that that's really important. Like, yes, be kind to your election officials and also for you guys to be kind to yourselves and to give yourself some grace because you are held at this level of perfection and like we said before, you're also just humans. And so I think that that's really important too. Um, yeah, I think it's also really important that we all check on each other, right? Yeah. That we check on each other. Are you doing okay? Is everything okay? You know, yeah. do you need to talk even for five minutes? Can I help? Is there anything yeah. I can share with you? Um, just being willing to do that with each other because nobody understands what you're going through, Kathy, like somebody else who's doing the job, right? Nobody else understands that level of emotion or pressure or stress or anxiety than a fellow election official. 
whether they're in your state or not, whether their processes are the same or not, the pressure is still the same. And so I really strongly encourage you to have a buddy, a, a, an election official buddy that says, hey, I need you to check in on me and I'm gonna check in on you and we're gonna get through this together. And I think that that is incredibly important to have some layer of accountability with a partner who's gonna make sure that you are mentally in a good space. Yeah, yeah. That's super important. Again, like you mentioned, it's we only we know what we go through. It's you know we cannot talk. You know we can't speak about our jobs um, to anyone else that's not in elections. Um, and I think that's super important to check on each other um, and to uh, you know just make sure that we're okay, even if it's just a hey. Yeah. And, and create a safe space for us also just to be able to vent about what's going on, because so much of everything that we do is public information. And, um, and so just to have that safe space is, is super important. Yeah. yeah. No, I, we would love to see some support groups start up for election officials, like something for you guys to come together, because uh, that can create such a healing space just to know that you're not alone and just to talk about things. Um, before I share a couple of resources, um, and maybe we can ask, answer some questions from the audience, we do have a Q&A on here if anyone would like to put in a question. Um, and is there any other last things that you guys want to share, Tina or Kathy? No, I mean, I, I saw in here, it looks like uh, Tanya has asked how you get past the feeling yeah. of, of being broken. And I, I don't know that you... I don't know that I've, I'm incredibly past it, but I think I'm still working through it. And I think what's important is that every day you are focused on, on, on getting better at that than you were the day before of, of dealing with that emotion a little bit more than you did the day before. And I don't know that we'll ever get away from it or get past it um, because it was life-changing uh, for so many of us. But I think with like a lot of emotions that we feel, whether it's grief or or betrayal or whatever it might be that you, you have to work through that emotion. And I think you have to do that. Like I said, by whether that's seeking help, um, from, you know, a professional source that can, can help you work through those emotions, whether it's that trusted friend, a fellow election official, whatever that is. But what I also want to say to you is however hard you feel on yourself right now, I guarantee you, you're 10 times better than that. You really, really are. We're so tough on ourselves. We're so hard on ourselves, so critical of ourselves. And you're really so much more, you're so much better, you know, so much brighter, all of those things than what you're giving yourself credit for. I just want to encourage you as you're going in through, into this next year, that you are exactly where you're supposed to be doing the exact job that you're supposed to be doing, that this country is dependent on people like you that are going to continue to plow through this, to make sure this election runs and runs well and, and is ran with integrity and that you have people back here like me that are cheering you all on, whatever I can do to be a resource or our team at the elections group, you know, we have resources out there for you. We want to do that. And I want you to know that there are people who really care about you, care about your safety and care about your mental health. Great. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, on that note, I do just want to share a couple of resources with you all, um, just, you know, in case anyone listening, if this brought up something for you and you feel like you want to talk to somebody, um, there are several resources available. Um, you can find a therapist near you. Um, a great resource for this is Psychology Today. Um, I can put a link in the chat in a minute um, where you can look up therapists in the area and they'll have a bio on them and you can look for therapists that might focus on certain types of therapy if you're looking for that. Um, and then there's the National Alliance on Mental Illness Helpline, um, which we'll also put on the chat. That's 1-800-950-6264. Um, and that is just another, it is not like the suicide um, crisis line, which we also will put in the chat. This is more of just if you need someone to talk to. Um, and if you're trying to find a therapist or a support group or something near you, they can help you find that in your area. They can help refer you, refer you to a therapist. Um, but there is also this uh, 988 suicide and crisis lifeline. 
um, as well. But we'll share all of these in the chat, um, as well as our uh, mental health wellness wellness resources again, which also have a link to a lot of these different resources. But if you have any other questions, we would love, we have a little bit more time and would love to see them in the chat. Although I believe Kathy will have to leave soon as she has a really important meeting she has to attend. Busy election official. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to sit on this panel, um, honestly, and, um, and Tina for, the all of the information that you have provided um and just for and um for the you know the carter center for, for providing all of the you know all the resources that that we need and just continuing to push those resources to us election officials um and to anyone that just um that that needs help mm -hmm. so thank you guys thank you thank you I'll stay on a minute, just taking these um, resources can also be found on the Carter Center website and in our resources, we link to the numbers I mentioned um, before, as well as to the information about um, Tina's work with the Committee for Safe and Secure Elections. Rachel, I would also encourage um, anybody who's on the webinar today, if they have resources that they need as election officials, yeah. if there's something that they wish they had or some sort of a resource that, that they could reach out to, to read, uh, some group to be a part of, you know, like you said, maybe it, it is some sort of a support group, whatever that might be. I would love to hear that from, um, from those that are in the webinar today of how do we fill that gap? How do we fill that space where you feel like you're at and, and your peace is at or whatever it is that, that you need that we can provide you? We would love to hear whatever that resource is. Yes. Yes, we definitely would. Not seeing any, many more questions, um, just some comments, which we really appreciate from everyone. Um, and we love just the opportunity to be able to create the space for everyone um, to come together and just talk about these shared experiences. Could I share, Rachel, too, that the elections group um, last week uh, also did a webinar where we talked about mental health. And we actually had Avery uh, from the Carter Center there, and we talked about the Carter Center products. We also had um, Captain Harold Love, who is retired from the Michigan State Police, who's also a licensed therapist here in Michigan, who has dealt a lot with law enforcement trauma and is seeing a lot of the same uh, responses in election officials with trauma. And uh, so that webinar is out there on the elections group website. And um, if anyone you know was on today's webinar that would be interested in seeing that, there was also some great information on there too. Yeah, um, and I see from Brianna, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, but a question about is there a support group or resource for parents in elections? I think that is a phenomenal idea. I don't currently know of anything like this. Um, we did a lot of research trying to find if there was any support groups for election officials when we we're putting together our wellness guide and couldn't find any. But if there are any, um, we would love to know about them because we would love to amplify those and make sure more people know about them. Um, but I love that idea. And as we think about expanding our mental health resources, I think we should definitely think about the fact that a lot of election officials are parents and how to talk about that. So thank you for that. And yes, thank you, Alice, for sharing that uh, the discount is screening for the No Time to Fail documentary. It is definitely great to watch. And I think we need to share it with people who also aren't election officials so they can know what it's really like and get a glimpse into that. All right, I think.
I'm not seeing any more comments. Is there any other last thoughts you want to share, Tina? No, just if anybody uh, needs to reach me, they can at tina at electionsgroup.com. And if you're interested in having us come out with the Committee for Safe and Secure Elections to your local community, your county, your state, um, reach out to me uh, there. And if I can be a resource to any of you in any way, and just want to say thank you for all you do from the bottom of my heart. You're amazing people. Great. Thank you, Tina. And I also shared my email in the chat. Um, you know, if the Carter Center, we've talked to several state election groups already about our mental health resources, and we would love to talk to your state um, elections group. So just reach out to us um, on that. Um, I would say somebody also just put out there a question about de-escalation techniques. We do have some de-escalation posters on the elections group uh, website that you can go to that not only are they de-escalation posters, but we also have de-escalation pocket guides that you can put in your um, precinct supplies to go out to your election workers. So they're smaller versions of the posters that you could use for your staff to put in their cubicles or whatever, but this could, they're also small enough to go out in your supply kits for your election workers. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for everyone for taking the time to join us. Um, and we hope that you reach out and join more conversations like this. Okay. And thank you again, Alice, for making this possible. And thanks for joining, Tina. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Take care.